Good afternoon, we are on chapter 6 of our Charlotte's Web afternoon read aloud. Remember where we left off? We were introduced to Charlotte the spider, and Char Charlotte told Wilbur that she would be his friend. Um, she seems friendly, but Wilbur was a little scared of her because Charlotte drinks the blood of flies. And remember, spiders, they make webs, and then the flies get caught in the web, and the spider has to go and wrap up the fly, and then the spider drinks its blood. And I remember Wilbur was really kind of freaked out about that. He didn't like that. He said, oh, you drink blood? But Charlotte did seem like a really friendly spider, and it does seem like she's going to be friends with Wilbur, and we know she's a main character because the title of our story is Charlotte's Web. So we haven't seen Fern in a while. I'm wondering where Fern is. Um, also, I'm wondering if the humans can hear the animals talk because we know the animals can talk to each other, but it doesn't seem like they can talk to the people. And we know our characters, Mr. Zuckerman and Avery, Fern's little brother, or older brother. And then there's Fern, the eight-year-old girl, just about your age. Um, and then there's the helper on the farm. So those are our human characters and our animals talk to each other, but they don't seem to talk to the humans. So I want you to be paying close attention, making connections and predictions, asking questions. And let's start. Chapter 6 is called Summer Days. The early summer days on a farm are the happiest and fairest days of the year. Lilacs bloom and make the air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come with the lilacs and the bees visit around among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends and the children have time to play and to fish for trout in the brook. Avery often brought a trout home in his pocket, warm and stiff to ready to be fried for supper. Now that school was over, Fern visited the barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine, and Mr. Zuckerman climbed into the seat and drove into the field. All morning, you could hear the rattle of the machine as it went round and round while the tall grass fell down behind the cutter bar in long green swaths. Next day, if there was no thunder shower, all hands would help rake and pitch and load, and the hay would be hauled to the barn in a high hay wagon, with Fern and Avery riding at top of the load. Then the hay would be hoisted, sweet and warm, into the big loft, until the whole barn seemed to, like a wonderful bed of timothy and clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in, and sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it to the other things in his pocket. Early summer days are a jubilee time for birds. In the fields, around the house, in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, everywhere love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow, which must come all the way from Boston, calls beep-a-deep, beep-a-deep, beep-a-deep. On an apple bow, the Phoebe teeters and wags its tail and says, Phoebe, 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 the song sparrow who knows a brief and lovely life who knows how brief and lovely life is, says, Sweet, 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 sweet. If you enter the barn, the swallows swoop down from their nests and scold, Chicky, 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 they say. In early summer, there are plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion stems are full of milk, clover heads are loaded with nectar, and the frigid air is full of ice-cold drinks. Everywhere you look is life. Even the little ball of spit on the weed stalk, if you poke it apart, has a green worm inside of it. And on the underside of the leaf of the potato vine are the bright orange eggs of the potato bug. It was on a day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched. This was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there sitting on her stool when it happened. All right, so we had a lot of description. Now the setting has changed. It went from springtime to summertime. We remember the goose was sitting on her eggs. Remember that? And here's Fern. So maybe that's why she didn't visit before. We had our question answered. Where is Fern? Well, she was at school. So now school's out. So summertime, Fern and her brother are on the farm helping out, sitting by the animals. And it says that the goose eggs um, hatched. So let's see what happened. Ex Fern was there on the stool when it happened. Except for the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the goslings had at last, at last arrived. The goose knew a day in advance when they were coming. She could hear their weak voices calling from inside the egg. She knew that they were in desperately, they were desperately cramped. 
positioned inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat quiet still and talked less than usual. When the first gosling poked its gray-green head through the goose's feathers and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made the announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of effort and patience on the part of our friend the goose, she now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer my sincere congratulations? Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, said Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlotte. Seven is a lucky number. Luck had nothing to do with this, said the goose. It was management and hard work. At this point, Templeton showed his nose from his hiding place under Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern and then crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for he was not well-liked and not trusted. Remember, Templeton is the rat. So seven eggs hatched, and Templeton is a little curious. Let's see what Templeton says. Look, he began in his sharp voice, you say you had seven goslings? There were eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? It's a dud, I guess, said the goose. Well, what are you going to do with it? continued Templeton, his little round beady eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to your nasty collection. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his home. He saved everything. Certainly, 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 said the gander. You may have the egg, but I tell you one thing, Templeton. If I ever catch you pokey okey oking your ugly nose around our goslings, I'll give you the worst pounding a rat has ever took. And the gander opened his strong wings and beat the air with them to show the power. She was strong and brave, but the truth is, both the goose and the gander were worried about Templeton. And with good reason, the rat had no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no co consideration, no decency, no milk of rodent kindness, no higher feelings and no friendliness, no anything. He would kill a gosling if he knew he could get away with it. The goose knew that. Everybody knew it. With her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of the nest, and the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Imagine wanting a junky old rotten egg, he muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed a tinkling little laugh. But my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, the barn will be untenable. What does that mean? asked Wilbur. It means nobody will be able to live here on account of the smell. A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. I won't break it, snarled Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. He disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged till he succeeded in rolling it to his lair under the trough. That afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the gray goose led her seven goslings off the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied them when he came with Wilbur's supper. Oh, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven baby geese. Now, isn't that lovely? So here's the end of our chapter. It was a short one. What happened in our chapter? The goose had her eggs. Fern came back to visit, and now it is summertime. So um, Templeton the rat was interested in that rotten egg. He wanted to eat it or store it away. So there were eight eggs and only seven hatched. And that's common with birds. Sometimes they'll have a rotten egg that doesn't hatch. So there are seven baby geese, and then one of the eggs didn't hatch, and Templeton wanted to save it. But he has to be careful because Charlotte said it's a stink bomb. So if that egg breaks, the whole barn will not be it. You won't be able to be in there. It will smell so bad. So I wonder what you think might happen with that rotten egg if you wanted to make a prediction. Because it seems like they talked a little bit about it. Templeton, they don't trust Templeton. He's a rat. They warned him, you better not mess with my babies. And the baby geese that live near me just had their babies. So if I can get a video of them, I'll share it with you because it's the cutest thing ever. And I made a connection with those geese in our book. 
Um, I hope you make connections. I hope you liked this chapter and watch tomorrow for our next chapter. Have a good afternoon.